Hi guys and welcome to Red Dwarf TV. This is the Smegcast episode 13 and today we are talking about mechocracy. I'm here with Mary. Good evening. Hello. Hello. In this episode, all the mechanical items of the ship, including the food dispensers and scutters, decide that they want representation and a human that they can liaise with after everyone tries to leave them behind when they abandon ship. The two people up are Rimmer and Crichton, and who will the mechanoids vote for? Uh, this was quite a, a good one. I think this was, uh, at the time, my favourite one when it, when it came out. Uh, what did you reckon? I am very much of, on the other side. Oh! Uh, I am. Um, this is my least favourite episode. Wow, I don't think that's a, a common opinion. What was it that, that didn't quite collect for you? <laughs> I, yeah, I'm having watched it and watched it again and still not liking it. I went online and, and quickly realised that I was in the minority. Um, just. It just didn't click for me. Uh, maybe I missed the point, and I'm happy to uh, be told that. I mean, it's not often that I'm, like, that I'm the kind of person that, is, that likes to be told that I'm wrong, but I'm happy to be told that in this instance because, one, it's my fault, and two, because I really do seem to be in the minority. I just felt that it was a bit weak, and I thought it was a weak episode and a bit cheesy. There's, there's a few moments in there that I just found a bit a bit cheesy just it just didn't work for me i probably you know i i will go back and rewatch the new series but that one i probably i might watch it again i might watch it a third time just to see but um i, I have no inclination to watch it again anytime soon yeah, that's. I wasn't expecting that. You, you just completely blindsided me there. I thought this is just the two of us. We'll just have a nice little banter, but we're completely on opposite ends because I think it's my second favourite episode of the series. And I think, I mean, there was obviously the the massive element of Talky Toaster. Yeah. I think that um, it would have to be a very, very bad episode for me not to love it just for the fact it's got Talky Toaster in it. And it's David Ross who is the second talkie toaster, who was also the first Crichton. So having him back on the show is massively nostalgic, and you know he's he's one of my favourite kitchen appliances. <laughs> and <laughs> I I think that that for a lot of people alone would have would have raised the episode up in in their esteem, regardless. But I mean, e even aside from that, I really I really enjoyed it. Um. I liked the complete ridiculousness of Rimmer trying to go against Crichton, despite Crichton pointing out constantly he's the only sensible choice for the role. Um, and I, I liked to do the um, the posters they used when they were going for election were all based on things like Stalin and, and people like that. They were mimicking real life uh, propaganda posters and films and things, which which I found very enjoyable. That was something that I, you know, there was elements of the the kind of two campaigns that I enjoyed. I, I quite like the little videos they did. They were trying to like scupper each other. Um, uh, they, that I enjoyed. Um, and coming back briefly to talk to I did enjoy uh, the uh, reappearance of the, the, that appliance. Um, it was good to hear David Ross back again, probably very briefly. And also I did like the closing moments where To hear a different an opinion it's uh yeah i i thought the you know the, the previous episode was the one that was being very very divisive with the the criticism and and so on and so forth that one seemed to be the one that's caused all all the the, the conversations online which were very very divided so it is interesting to hear a different opinion on this one that's been pretty much universally accepted as as uh, everyone's, you know, so a lot of people's favourites looking at Twitter. Yeah, it, it, I enjoyed the 
the banter between them and I kind of enjoyed the inevitability of it all because Rimmer is obviously the more underhanded of the two and they end up having to do dirty dealings either way in the smear campaign. I like the way they involved information that went way back to series one and they had the first ever Crichton voice in that episode and then they were harking back to the first ever Crichton's actions where he was serving skeletons that he hadn't realised had passed away and using that as a way to say he was incompetent at his job and things like that. It did have a, a lot of those nostalgia elements and things that were funny, I thought, on their own, but were funnier if you were a fan of the series, which made it... Because I think sometimes the episodes are so nostalgic now they can be a little bit impenetrable, whereas this one I felt was quite easy to understand from having no knowledge at all. Um, I wonder if that was one of the things that made it less funny for you, was that it it didn't... Um, I don't know. I can't work this out. You've you've started a mystery now. This is going to be the most <laughs> confusing episode of this show so far. Well, I've spoken to two, um, two friends. Um, so two friends I made at this year's Dimension Jump convention back in April. I've spoken to them online each week. You know, can actually find the latest episode. Um, and they both enjoyed it. And I had to fess up and say, I'm "Sorry, guys, I'm not just for people like you on it." Um, um, thinking about now, don't get me wrong, as I've said, there are the things I enjoyed. I enjoyed the degree of the talk toaster. I enjoyed um, the, the kind of the, the campaign element, like the, the kind of the, the videos that they're doing to show around the ship you know, to get the machines on their side, on their side, so to speak. Um, and the other bit that I um, think about that I did quite like is just Rimmer being Rimmer, just being devious and, and basically taking that long knowledge at the start where if, you know, it comes back the cat uh, it might be helped actually quite perfect glasses and uh, kind of using that to his advantage because then obviously he uses that to blackmail him to become his kind of want to help be on his campaign because he knows he, you know, cat's vanity can bear the fact that people might find out that he, he might end up coming to my glasses so yeah, I was quite surprised no one figured out that Kat was being blackmailed. I think that was the only bit for me which was a little bit, they all kind of were just a bit mystified Kat was helping him, and I think they should have guessed that he had something on Kat. Surely Lister would have been like, right, what's, what's he what's he done to get this power over him? You're right, I can just imagine if this was like a... I'm sure maybe something like this has happened in earlier episodes, like from the earlier series, where Lister's suddenly gone, and gone a minute, he started to kind of talk him through and work something out. Mm. Uh, and that's probably, yeah, he's done that in the past, so yeah, you're right. But he didn't figure it out. Yeah, because he figured it out when, um, which uh, it might have been series one or two, when Cat has these, like, these are my shiny things, and I'm keeping these shiny things, and it's all the packets of cigarettes. And uh, Rim was trying to manipulate him, but then Lister manages to get all the cigarettes off Cat anyway. Um, I think he even does that off screen. It's so kind of unimportant that he, he just manages to kind of get the information out of him. So I think that was the only bit for me where I think they would have been like, oh, all right, all right, what's, what's he done? What's he got on you? Will, you know, they could have tried to have paid Cat off by doing something to counter it. Um, but other than that, I, I quite, I quite liked everything about this one, to be honest. Um, it was, it was very enjoyable and I loved the ending because one of the things I, said about some of the previous episodes was that I felt the endings were very just sort of sudden a little bit cut off in places like the, the shorter time length of the episode had affected them and this was one of the ones where I really felt like the ending really worked and it felt very concluded and it had a good punchline at the ending um, compared to say the episode before where I felt they just sort of stopped and flew away with no real sort of proper summing up yeah you know what? I'd have to go back and rewatch the others. Um, basically, the um, what I know is generally, depending much briefly, we are we are talking about episode um, four on this one, but um, um, yeah, time wave one is not very well liked. I can mm. find a scene why, like for me, um, I didn't mind that one, but I can totally see why it might be her. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I yeah, I think it was a nice. Reminiscence of um, when he was stuck in a cell in the real world. 
<laughs> yes, it was a bit. It was that same level of he's fully understanding of the horrible situation he's in and that there's nothing we can do. It is it is sheer frustration and, and hatred with no outlet other than to just make some kind of primeval noise that's very unrimmer-like, yet he seems to do a reasonable amount of frequency. Yeah, I mean, I suppose he had to uh, do that more of frustration because he had the balls to grind. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, they should reinstate the uh, Chinese Wari balls that, that he had, although they, they were tiny by the end of that episode, weren't they? They'd have to get him some new ones. They got they got less than new guitars, they could get him some new ones of those out of... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Have some humanity, not that Rimmer always particularly deserves it. So, if you were within this episode not disliking it at the time, who would you have voted for? Ooh. Is Crichton um. just too nice and could he not actually get the job done, or is Rimmer just too self-serving and evil? Well, that's difficult because, you know, Crichton is our favourite Bob Box, and I mean that in the nicest possible way, <laughs> so I do like Crichton. However, Rimmer can get a campaign going, we saw that in Oh no, my fan girl has explained me the episode in the early series where it's the wax droids to, to um... Oh yes, uh, the wax world one, I know the one you mean, yes. He manages to, to yeah, it's take charge one. of everything, <laughs> yeah. He did manage to get a campaign going, but he also managed to completely destroy them all. Oh, I forgot the episode, I guess, well we both have an episode, <laughs> Uh, so we know that he can take take a campaign on and run it, and you know in that episode it was it was him and Crichton that were, were down on that world first, and, and you know he stepped up. So perhaps you know, perhaps I would have voted for Rimmer because he has previous history. Um, of, well, <laughs> of attempting <laughs> attempting to manage something. Yeah. Oh, I think that's probably going to be a, a controversial answer as well. This is. This is an interesting one. We get some debate going in the comments section for this one. If anyone would like to vehemently disagree with this particular ruling, please, please politely know. Disagree. <laughs> vehemently disagree because think about it. That campaign with the wax droids was terrible. It killed them all. So who's to say that who's going to do any better by the vending machines? Yeah. No one is like walking in the state box and just saving himself. So. But that's how the whole episode started, was he was the one about to abandon all of them anyway. They have very short memories, these vending machines, I do say. <laughs> but yeah, I think you were choosing between two flavours of incompetence. It's like the worst ice cream parlour in the world. It's like, would you like this fried dead rat, or would you like this different roadkill? Um, <laughs> it's just, it wasn't going to go well either way, I think. Um, they probably needed some kind of coalition going. I think they always could have made um slightly more relevant uh, political modern day jokes since they've been doing some some satire of current events. But I think that was an opportunity there. Maybe they anyway, weren't quite brave enough, despite the Murdoch and BBC jokes, to actually quite go there. But I think um yeah, they probably could have made some more of um mocking parliamentary procedure and and so forth. Especially since Rimmer does love, even if he always gets them wrong procedure and commands and rule books. Yes. Um, I was just thinking actually, um, it was unusual to see uh, Rimmer when he was doing his campaign, kind of going into the vending machines uh, in the corridors. Um, he switched to a traditional suit, didn't he? Ooh, I, I had not spotted that. I will have to rewatch that. You call yourself a fan of this episode, Bex. Come on! <laughs> I'm sorry, I've I've only seen it the the twice. I'm not up to the, the 55 times you'll be by next week. Still, um, trying to, to figure out why it's everyone's favourite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will have to rewatch that bit and see. I I almost felt like he needed a, a mechanoid baby to kiss, like a you know a little tiny scutter. Because we know some of the scutters, like, you know, Bob the scutter has, has a missus at home and things. It would have been nice to have him kiss the forehead of a baby scutter. <laughs> I think that would have just polished off the kind of American campaign trail analogy that they were going for there. So, yeah, I think we can generally agree that nobody was worth voting for. And thankfully, neither of them will take on any of their duties after that episode is finished anyway. So it is at least of absolutely no consequence. Though I very much doubt they're going to enact their duties. It was... um. More just something to do. I think when you're in space for that long and you're on your own and everyone around you is at smeg, then um, you just have to come up with things to do. Yeah, 
So at the end, what do you think about Cat and his glasses? Do you think he should have kept them? No. Um, I really enjoyed uh, that moment. That was one of the last I enjoyed moments for the episode. Um, and uh, <laughs> because I know I've spent a lot of time on this podcast in the world already on this on episode four, but you, you know, there are moments in the middle of the and him lending his glasses up is, is something that is meant enough. So I was, I was happy to ditch the glasses, um, uh, it, it, was just, it was just a funny moment for me, and I'm fine to have them, but uh, I think you wanted him to keep them, didn't you? Yeah, that's one of the few bits of the episode I didn't like, because we're completely and utterly opposite on this one, because I wanted him to keep the glasses and secretly be doing lots of reading and getting smarter in the background, but then pretending that he wasn't. Like, so in the future, they'd ask a question and he'd know the answer and then he'd pretend he didn't know the answer or something. I I mean, he has slowly been getting smarter and learning anyway, so I guess that can kind of happen on its own naturally. But yeah, it's uh, it's weird that the points that you love, I wasn't so keen on, and, and vice versa with this one. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. Yeah, I'm sure um, there would be an episode that we talk back together where we would both agree on... Um, yeah he could have blinged them up or something i think he could have gone full dame edna with some blinged up cat glasses which would have been quite nice <laughs> yeah. integrated them into the cat's wardrobe so this next bit i'm i'm scared to ask out of five mary <laughs> lay it on me um i think it's gotta be two. Ooh, and i'm probably up the other end at like at least 4.5 so that should even out nicely awesome <laughs> Yes, because you're wrong. <laughs> as long as we both agree you're wrong, we're on the same page, my friend. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to hear that it wasn't your favourite episode, but something is someone's favourite is someone else's worst episode. I think that is always the way with these things. And I've had the same with, with Time Wave. People have had it as their favourite episode or their most hated episode. And I think that, that's you know, they do so many different types of, of humour within within Red Dwarf, it's always going to be someone's favourite and someone's least. So yeah, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Mm, but the um the next episode is generally held by everyone to be particularly good, although we shall not go into that one today. They'll save that for the next episode. But until then, I think that this is uh, me, Bex Trister, and Mary signing off for the day. And we will say goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much for listening, guys. Please subscribe to Red Dwarf TV to see more of our Red Dwarf videos, exclusive interviews, and updates and news. And we will see you guys next time. Goodbye. Hi, guys. Welcome to Red Dwarf. Do ah, <laughs> <laughs> well, that went well. I got half a line in. Woo! Uh, take two. <laughs>